So welcome to episode 10 of Low Carbon Lifestyle. Um, in this episode, we hear from my great mate, Nikki, um, who is an expert on all things food, particularly sustainable food and the scandal of food waste. We filmed this back in the summer, sort of like the end of August, start of September. I've only just finished editing it because I set myself a bit of a challenge by having multiple camera angles with different microphones, all this kind of thing. Uh, but the content is really fantastic. Um, it gives a fantastic explanation of what a low carbon diet could look like. And it might be my longest video, but it's definitely my best video. I hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Tom, and this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. Sometimes this whole sustainable living can feel well, well intimidating, whether it's thinking you need to buy an electric car or install solar panels on your roof, the majority of us can't do that overnight. We can't do that straight away. Or it looks like completely changing the way you live, living off the land or turning vegan overnight, both of which are fantastic things. But for this mini series, we're gonna talk through how each of us can lower our emissions in everyday life and what that might look like. Okay, so welcome to episode, what are we on? Episode 10? Episode 10 maybe? I'm gonna check that and I'll get back to you, of uh, Low Carbon Lifestyle. Today, we're, as I said, we're in Refuse, and this is gonna be a really good conversation with my bezzy mate, Nikki. So we've known each other, I was working out, we've known each other for um, 11 years, no, 10 years and 11 months, basically today. Yeah. So in yeah, a month's today. time, yeah, yeah. we'll know each other for 11 years, which is um, amazing. So we've been through thick and thin, we've- um, Been through university. Lived together. Even the, the beginning stages of bin diving for Refuse, which you can tell us a little about, a bit about. I was the guy in the car with the engine on, ready to go, just in case. So tell us a little bit about Refuse. What do you do, you do here? What do you achieve? So we're an organisation that is working to end food waste in the North East. We um, collect about a ton, uh, sorry, 10 tonnes, 11 tonnes a month of wow. food okay. that would otherwise have been wasted. Um, we sort it, we weigh it, we redistribute it to various different places, whether that's catering or to other charities. To us, running a shop at the moment. Um, yeah, because of coronavirus, it's not, it's not, the cafe can't work at the moment yeah. in the same way. But, so. but you've had restaurant nights and it's a, a shop at the moment with the, with the, the takeaway coffees and takeaway cakes. Takeaway coffees, and stuff. yeah, some, some takeaway food. And, and a cafe, a small cafe, but like three tables nice. at the moment. Okay. But, um, but yeah, normally it's like this kind of vibrant, um, hub of community yeah, that yeah, happens here yeah. um, and all the food that we serve is on a pay-as-you-feel basis so people okay. pay by using their time money or skills um, nice. uh, which makes for this kind of yeah kind of hodgepodge of community that uh, from people from all walks of life getting involved in all sorts of different ways uh, which is really good fun so Nikki okay. I need a little help okay I've dealt with all this easy stuff in low carbon lifestyle so far finance dead easy heat pumps dead easy Electric vehicles, dead easy. Talk to me about food. Why is it important and uh, why is it a, a, an important part of our thinking for low carbon lifestyle? It's a massive part. 24% of greenhouse gas emissions um, come from food and agriculture. Okay, wow. land, land use 36% if you include the transport used to, okay. to get it to our plates. 60% um, of biodiversity loss is attributed to food and agriculture. Um, so it's a massive part of, of climate change climate crisis of yeah, the yeah. contribution to it and uh i think it you know bigger than bigger than transport which you wouldn't have necessarily thought of sure. yeah for me i hear all those facts and then i hear that, that we waste a third of the food that is wow. great for us to be used so just straight away for me 36 percent of all of our emissions are to do with food um and we waste a third of it mm. okay wow okay and, and for me like food is a is a vital part of human our human survival and it's it's a huge kind of um, thing that shows inequality around the world and, um, and our access to it and access to the right nutrition is both an indicator of climate change and, and, and something that is um, exacerbated by climate change. So it's a massive thing um, in, in terms of the climate crisis, um, but I get really excited by it because um, a bit like you, kind of making real simple steps um, in, in kind of how we live our lifestyle. Yeah. It is something that we all, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone in the whole world comes across every day yeah, and yeah. works to, you know, ha makes decisions on three yeah. times a day. Yeah, um, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and so it is something that you know we can influence change on, sure. and we can think about and uh, and engage with um, yeah. at, at every level. And I've got an illustration with a pizza that I would like to show you. Let's go to the kitchen. So I found Mike Berners Lee, who um, is the brother of Tim Berners Lee, who invented the internet. This book really helpful in that he does a thing where he works out the um, kind of global calories grown per person per day and the amount of calories that we actually need per person per day. Okay. So I'm going to make this little chart that he gave us into a pizza illustration. So good. <laughs> we humans need energy to live. Um, so on average, taking into account all the kind of different ages and genders and sizes and lifestyles around the world, we need to consume about 2,350 calories per person per day. But the world average consumption is about 180 calories more than that. We consume too much. Globally, we grow 5,940 calories of food per person per day. So that's nearly two and a half times as much as, as the 2,350 that we need, the average person needs to remain healthy. So what happens to the food that we grow? Globally, this, this pizza represents 9,750 calories of plant matter grown per person per day. Of this, 5,940 are edible by humans. The other 3,810 we'll put aside for later. So this is grass and pasture. Um, food, land that is used, food that is grown, um, that is not edible to humans. After that, um, of the 5,940 edible, edible food grown for humans, 810 calories are non -food, go to non-food uses, like growing biofuel, which is not necessarily a bad thing. 130 calories is, are replanted, that's 1%, which is a good idea, gives us crops for next year. 340 calories don't get harvested, and that's due to cosmetic standards in developed countries or supply exceeding the commercial demand or order cancellations and harvesting difficulties, inefficiencies. 330 calories, 330 calories, again another 3%, gets lost in storage, um, particularly in poorer countries with a lack of infrastructure. So I'm going to chop all them off. Animals eat a whopping 1,740 calories of crops that are edible to humans. And of this, they, they leave us 590 calories to use in meat and dairy so that we can eat. Bring the grass and pasture back in and I'll chop a bit of that off and a bit of this off. And we can eat that as humans, but we can't eat that. 310 calories are lost in processing and distribution. That's another 3%. 260 are lost in household food waste come on to when I talk about refuse and 110 calories 180 calories our food is food that we actually don't even need to um to eat but we do we we consume too much as a, as a human race so we're left with we're left with 24 percent of all of the calories that are grown to actually eat have as, as human consumption or is, is actually what we need so lots more food is grown uh, lots more land and resources are used to grow it than we actually need. Lots of waste here, but for me, I see a lot of opportunity to make changes with each of these steps I described, whether it's uh, improving storage and infrastructure, whether it's not eating more than we need. If, so like if all humans were a healthy weight and ate only what they needed to maintain the planet, it would uh, liberate food for about a billion people, that 180 calories per person per day. Um, but for me, the most stark part of this illustration is um, the food that is grown to um, feed animals. I hope you've noticed but that about half of my pizza has gone to waste through animal agriculture. Um, we feed animals 1,740 calories of, of crops to get protein out of them, but they are hugely inefficient machines um, if they were tra treated as machines um, and they actually only give us from that 1,740 calories, we only get 590 calories out as edible human protein um, because they um, lose energy through heat and through defecation and through um, running about, running about <laughs> all that kind of thing. We're, in all, we're left with 24%, just a quarter of the pizza, 
of food that we actually eat as humans or we actually need as humans. All of this is waste and this is grass and pasture that's waste as well. Way more land and resources that are used to grow food than we actually need. But the most stark thing that I want to show in this illustration is that I hope you notice that about half of this pizza, so these two, this big slice and these two, has gone to waste through animal agriculture. So whether it's grass and pasture that, or whether it's food that is grown that could have been eaten by humans, that's wasted because of animal inefficiency, the inefficiency of animals. Okay, that's kind of an amazing illustration. So about a third of what we could eat goes to waste, and then a third of the stuff we grow is wasted just because it's grass and pasture, but we could be growing crops on it, I guess. So we're gonna eat some pizza, but um, basically what you're saying there, meat's a big problem, I think. Um, are you basically gonna tell us all to go vegan? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> um, as we eat our cheesy pizza, and I know you love pizza, Bob, <laughs> this would otherwise have gone to waste. Honestly, it would have been in the bin today. So I'm a. Uh, it tastes it's good. Right. It tastes it's good. Right to eat today. No guilt. Bin pizza is good. <laughs> the problem comes when you treat animals like machines. Um, if you treat animals like machines, um, they're ridiculously inefficient machines. Mm -hmm. About ten percent of the energy that we put into an animal mm -hmm. um, we get out as calories that we can eat. Okay. Um, so because they they convert the energy of the, that they eat into heat, into um, yeah, the energy that they need to run around mm -hmm. um, and into poo. So yeah, whilst more than two thirds of all farm animal food are grass and pasture, um, which we can't actually directly eat, um, the human edible crops that we feed to humans, so there's, that's this bit. Even that is uh, more than three quarters of the cal calorific needs of the entire po human population. Wow. We eat animals. We can't eat grass and pasture, which is true. Um, and yeah, so, so some people say that that's when uh, we should eat meat, which, which may be true in some cases. So eating in gra like locally produced grass-fed um, food, uh, meat might be okay, but overall it's a way too far of a weighted argument. And my simplified kind of argument back is that um, that land could be used for other things. It could be used for biodiversity. It could be used um, to grow food that we can eat yeah, as humans. Yeah. And too much kind of deforestation and all that kind yeah. of thing happens um, for In order to... food for animals to eat rather yeah. than humans. Yeah. So what I'm saying overall is yes, go veggie, go vegan. Brilliant, great yeah. idea. Yeah. Cutting our global consumption of meat, um, even halting the still increasing global trend yeah. is essential okay. um, for our food supply, for our climate, for our biodiversity. Um, we probably need to about half the global um, consumption of meat um, globally, which actually means that in developed countries like ours, we need to weigh more than half yeah. um, to, to kind of give a bit of sure. a chance to, to more developing countries yeah, yeah, that are yeah. increasing their meat consumption at the moment. But I'm not, I'm not asking for extremism here. Yeah. I'm not saying everyone should become um, angry vegans. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be judgmental or angry sure. if you eat a pizza every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. But what I am asking for is a moderation. I'm asking to treat meat as a treat, um, yeah, nice. something special, something yeah. that the earth has paid for. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And not something that we're going to have every meal. The good news is that loads of our generation, loads of our friends yeah. are becoming vegan, are yeah, vegetarian, are, yeah. are getting this idea. There's way more like exciting options in the supermarket and, and recipes and, and all sorts of things going out there um, for, for eating less meat um, and for, for kind of protein alternatives. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tried the, uh, the Impossible Burger a few uh, weeks ago and it was amazing. It was like, this is impossible, this is a, this is a beef burger, but it's just made from plant protein. Amazing. Yeah. I find it a bit weird, so I don't eat beef, so I sort of like, yeah. it's just sort of, <laughs> looks too much like beef, it's not something I want, but something, it is, you know, it's great for people that yeah, do yeah. want that. I think if you do talk to our, our friends and, and, and if you do try things like that, you can see that a vegan slash vegetarian eating less meat lifestyle um, is healthier, is yeah, more definitely. energy, is cheaper, yeah, um, yeah. and is not like not necessarily like a harsh and difficult and more complicated way of being. It's it's rather than kind of saying we're being restrictive on the meat that we eat, we're actually trying to say let's just broaden and diversify our 
um, our diets and, yeah. and what we eat. So rather than kind of assuming it's going to be meat to veg and, and saying, um, shall we have potatoes, pasta or rice with our meat tonight? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Just how I used to cook all the time. It's like chicken with something else, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Rather than that, we're saying, okay, shall I have grains, beans, mm. soya, um, yeah, tofu, yeah, yeah. meat, egg or cheese tonight with yeah. my... All those options. You yeah. know, um, so even just doing that, even just diversifying our, um, yeah. our menus, if we all did that in the UK, it would make a massive difference. Yeah. I'm not asking for extremism, sure. but I am asking to treat me as something that the cost the uh, It's precious, for. yes. Yeah. So meat's a treat or we could get plant-based proteins and stuff, but don't we... Like one of the arguments against like veganism is we need protein from meat for those muscle building exercises and to be healthy. Is that not is that not a big issue? Uh, it's we eat far too much protein than we okay. need to, um, and so it's a kind of overloaded myth, I guess. Right. And actually, gram for gram, a gram of beef and a gram of soya. A soy bean has all the nutrients and protein that a gram of beef would have. Okay. And um, every essential nutrient. Um, an amino acid um, that you need. Soya contains all of the nine essential amino acids that we need for eating protein. Plant-based proteins, there are plenty yeah, and yeah. they are rich in, in fibre and car complex carbohydrates and, and less fat than, than meat protein would have. We have a worldwide surplus of protein. We eat far more than we need and, uh, and just like in, in tracking the world's calories, um, Mike Berners-Lee also does a track the world's protein and, and shows that animals do not help okay. <laughs> with the world supply of protein. Okay. They destroy nearly three quarters of the often human edible protein that is produced for the world. So we can get protein from more than just meat. That's great. That's brilliant. Some people will still want to eat some meat. Okay. So um, could we encourage people to make a sustainable choice in what they eat? So are some are some meats better than others in terms of the CO two story? Yeah, for example, oh wait, this is again like if we're going to treat animals like a machine, like yeah, a, as I've yeah. said already, which we don't want to anyway because yeah. they are sentient beings. So for example, chicken, um, yeah. if we're going to treat it like um, a machine, it is more efficient than um, a cow, mainly and, and a big thing because they it's not um, ruminant, it doesn't burp and fart methane like cows okay, do. Okay. But the, the kind of efficiency win comes when um, chickens are all packed into a right, massive... Okay. Um, warehouse that they're, they're like pushed pushed together yeah. so that they can't walk yeah. they grow really fast which yeah. actually means that their, their bones don't grow properly yeah. so they can't walk and yeah. they look they don't lose heat because they're all packed in yeah. all that kind of thing that makes them more efficient yeah but yeah. obviously it's not very nice yeah um, so in simple terms chicken's better than beef but actually what what we're actually doing to achieve that efficiency is really pretty horrid yeah and, and then you can get free-range chickens but that causes a huge amount of other environmental problems, okay, like, okay. like their poo has phosphate in it, okay. it runs into the rivers, it causes eutrophication, wow. all that kind of thing. Yeah, so. it's not as simple as, as you might imagine. Fish, you might ask. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to swap hands because it's hurting. really hurting. <laughs> yeah. Fish, you might ask, yes. um, has, a, has a relatively low carbon impact in terms of a kind of protein source. Um, not all fishing is unsustainable um, if it is properly managed. Yeah. Um, farmed fish, aquaculture, um, now has almost overtaken wild caught fishing in okay. the world. And again, if it's well managed, um, could be a relatively sustainable option as a protein source. Um, but there's lots of lots of factors and variables of the species and the methods of farming. Um, how much antibiotics is, are used um, and, and overcrowding of, of the fish and how they make the fish feed is massive yes. so a lot of um, fish are fed on fish which okay. are caught um, wow. okay. uh, and is an industry that's kind of rife with slavery yeah, and that kind gosh. of thing. There is some work going on to kind of synthesise fish oils so out of plant matter okay. um, which would be a really good thing so yeah, we're yeah. not having to feed fish on fish or on insects. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a simple answer on fish in general, I'm afraid. And Mike Berners Lee gives a bit more um, thought. thought on yeah. it. And my parents are fish farmers, yeah, so yeah. I've got a bit of um, kind of experience and, and vested interest. interest in all of that. <laughs> um, there's a lot of kind of misleading like, labelling, even like NFC okay. and all that kind of thing. Doesn't actually mean a huge amount. And, okay. and there's kind of misleading stuff going out, out there. And, and cost doesn't actually 
relate to how sustainable it is either. Um, there's a lot of kind of dodgy marketing that goes on. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. So Mark Brown actually suggests getting to know your um, kind of fishmonger and, and kind of asking about each different fish yeah. and where it comes from. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, so we're going to eat some pizza, that's a good summary, uh, and then we're going to be back in the cafe for the next part. Okay, so um, we want less meat, less dairy, we want meat for a treat like our friend Sean says, um, we might want some fish but make sure it's nice fish, we want because fish are friends not food, thank you Nemo. Fish are friends, not food. Um, we want to eat more plant based foods, I kind of like it, we're getting somewhere with this sustainable diet, sustainable lifestyle stuff. Um, but you mentioned soya, like where do we grow soya and maybe even where do we grow bananas? Talk to me a little bit about food miles. Um, is buying in the UK or locally produced food always the best way for a low carbon lifestyle? Yeah, so food miles, um, food is grown, produced, harvested um, somewhere and it has to, the, the distance it takes to get to us is, is food miles. Yeah. Um, so we're in the habit of uh, buying lamb from New Zealand and asparagus and mangoes from Peru, okay, well. chocolate from the Ivory Coast. Yeah. Uh, so we, yeah, we get food from all over the world and, and we've got an amazing food system to mean that we can get food from all over the world 24-7. And get it fresh. You know? And fresh, yeah. Uh, so I could do this one, the further away the food's going from, that's that simple, that means more emissions. Um, if you travel more miles, more emissions is dead easy. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, so it's uh, to do with ha how, like the the transport of getting food to us is um, is actually like quite a small percentage okay. of the carbon emissions that um, are produced in food. It's more to do with how they're produced. But the thing that we we need to get rid of in the world is air freighting food. So yeah, yeah, okay. it, yeah so food is, is super fresh. It needs to be brought. To, it needs to be transported to us um, by plane, and that doesn't need to happen yeah, yeah, yeah. in our world. Sure. If it's coming by boat, it's relatively sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we don't want things to be air freighted. Fine. How would we go about knowing whether something's been air freighted or not? Sadly, it's not a label. There's no label on yeah. the food that you're going to buy. They don't make it clear. It's all to do with the kind of freshness and, and the type of food that you're getting. So things like apples and oranges and bananas are fine to be picked and to ripen on their on their way on right, the boat. Okay. But things like grapes and asparagus and strawberries, maybe beans, um, are not going to be stay fresh on a boat, so they're going to be air freighted in. Okay. Um, so if we're not sure whether it's air freighted, um, would you say that the best, most sustainable way to, to buy food and eat food is just is just to buy food grown in the UK? Again, not necessarily. Oh. <laughs> and again, and this is where it's to do with how it's produced. It's okay. such a much bigger kind of carbon emissions on, on how food is produced than how it's transported to us. And that is because um, some food, uh, like for example, strawberries growing in Scotland, are grown in massive greenhouses right. that are um, heated uh, and therefore hugely carbon intensive. And so, gr so buying strawberries in January even if they are from Scotland, which is up sure. the road for us, is, yeah. um, is not a sustainable yeah, way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, loads of energy to heat greenhouses. I, I was actually this week at the, the greenhouse that grows all the plants for all the, the roundabouts across County Durham, which is heated by two really old gas boilers. Wow. And so I can imagine that to heat like big industrial greenhouses, that could be a big problem. If we don't know how things are grown or how they're transported, who, who can we trust? How do we even eat sustainably? So yeah, a good place to start would be to kind of eat locally, as, as local as possible, maybe from your own garden, yeah, yeah. and seasonally. Um, so yeah, not getting strawberries in December um, is a good place to start. So it's kind of getting to know, getting to know your food, where it comes from, trying to understand the chain, the food chain that it comes on, supply chain, and getting to know your farmers even, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Like if we can really get to know our food supply chains, then we can become kind of citizens of them rather than just like consumers of them. Yeah, yeah. So some of the lowest carbon food must be the stuff you grow in your own garden. And this evening we've just got some apples from the tree, some carrots from our neighbor, Jeff, and one of many beetroots that uh, Esther just picked. We've also had um, some leeks, down here, we had some carrots earlier in the year. Got some cauliflower that seems to have bolted. 
Um, we had some munch too. We've had some uh, courgette, uh, a load of herbs. It's all overgrown, but we've had loads of stuff out of it. We've had some strawberries. And down here, we've got what we like to call the orchard, a few trees. But this one this year has fruited really well. There's still some other apples that aren't quite ready to pick. And then in the greenhouse, um, we have overgrown full of tomatoes that I'm hoping will fruit in the next week or so. We've had some kale and some broccoli, some leeks and the beets are down there. So it was a lot of hard work earlier in the year during lockdown, but we've got some produce, which we love. It does feel like growing your own food must be a low carbon way to live. Brill, so what I've got so far is we need to, to live a sustainable lifestyle with our food. We need to eat seasonally. We need to eat locally. We need to eat a little less meat and dairy. Um, and that's it. That's, that's the sustainable diet. Well, not really, because we haven't yet talked about food waste. The elephant is, in the room. <laughs> the elephant in the room is why we're here. Yeah. We don't eat all of the food that we produce okay. for humans to eat. And if you think about the land and the energy and the resources, fertiliser that goes into making that food, it's hugely costly to our planet. And even after those losses that I showed goes to animal feed and biofuels on that pizza, we still waste a third of all the food that is grown mm -hmm. for humans to eat. So, and that's like from farm to fork, yeah. whether it's cosmetic standards or like bad practices from the supermarket of ordering and then cancelling or poor storage and infrastructure, particularly in third world countries or in manufacturing or in our own households. And at Refuse, like I said, we, we collect 11 tonnes of food um, a month and that's just, a t it's like scratching the surface yeah. really of how much food is wasted and, and, and for all sorts of reasons. It might be because of barcodes being printed wrong, it might be because of like damaged packaging where one one box is damaged and they throw the whole pallet away. It might be because of logistical errors. It's often not to do with date labeling, yeah. um, which is what most people sort of assume is, yeah. is why we, we get food waste. And we're working really hard here to see that food feeds bellies, not bins yeah, is our yeah. slogan. Yeah. But we're also really working hard to kind of raise awareness of this and try and kind of promote idea of, of food waste and, and wasting less food in our own households as well. Right. Yeah. So we do like education, we, we teach in schools, and we do all sorts of different things. Um, because 25% of a, a household's carbon footprint is um, food and drink. Okay, um, wow. And of that, a sort of 30 to 50% is, is food that is thrown in the bin in households. Um, apparently it's £750 a year average um, that we throw away worth of food in the UK a year. And I, in my calculations, I've kind of ignored that because it's too difficult to work out, you know, the tw that 25%. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's just count the things we can count. But that's so significant. And it's crazy. Um, and if we didn't waste as much as we do, that third of food waste or £750 a year, wherever it would be, that really would be a step change in our emissions. And that would be an overnight step change and we'd save money. So, so what are your tips for kind of saving food in the household, I guess? Just planning what, what yeah. food you're going to eat um, in a week uh, makes a massive difference. Like before you go to the supermarket, checking what you've got in the fridge already and making some sort of plan of the meals that includes what leftovers you've got in the fridge. Um, be, like just enjoying kind of using your leftovers, being creative with your food, not having to stick to, to recipes so that, um, so that you can use up all the different odds and ends that are in your fridge. Cooking in batches, using your freezer really well. Yeah. All that kind of thing. I mean, living with you over the years, I've been amazed at uh, the, the ability to conjure up a meal out of seemingly nothing, and like a really good meal. And I've always been like, oh, we need exactly the ingredients on this recipe, or we can't make anything. And I can't even imagine. So it's been amazing to see that. And it's a talent, but it's we can all start doing, isn't it? Is is having to think about what's in the fridge or what's in the, our cupboards that that either either needs to be used or or could make something and be creative. I think that's really great. We really can make some decisions that reduce our emissions linked to our diet and our lifestyle. And we might not be able to count it in the same way that I was trying to get us to do with our gas and electricity bills, for example, um, or our driving. But it's definitely something that we can be doing something about. And there are lots of changes we can make to reduce. Well, another plug then from uh, Mike Berners-Lee. So we've just looked at his uh, No Planet P book, but there's another book called How Bad Are Bananas, which he um, wrote a few years ago, and he's got an updated yeah, version right. now. 
um, where he does actually measure um, the carbon equivalent of, of each item of food. Okay. I mean, like, I'm not sure how much time I'm going to spend yeah, like a diet plan yeah. going through my bananas and my different things, but but it's really it's a really good book to read to kind of see the equivalence of like sure. stuff that we've talked about of like whether something's air freighted or whether something where it's grown and how it's grown and all that kind of thing. And uh, like just as an example, he he kind of he does it as like a working out your carbon dioxide equivalent yeah. of each item of, of food and well and, and all sorts of different things yeah. as well as food. And he does it as like a percentage of your ten ton lifestyle. Okay, great. So if he's gonna try and produce ten tons in a year, yeah. that this is what your lifestyle is gonna be. And he gives an example, a pint of beer. So like what's the what's the kind of carbon equivalent of, of drinking a pint of beer? He says drinking locally brewed cask ale at the pub would be three hundred grams of carbon dioxide uh-huh. equivalent. Pint of foreign beer in a pub or a local or local bottled beer from the shop would be 500 grams carbon dioxide equivalent, and bottled beer from the shop that has been extensively transported, yeah. so like from across the other side of the world or something, would be 900 grams carbon dioxide equivalent. Wow. So a pint of local ale in the pub per day, every day, would be 1% of your 1010 lifestyle. Okay. But if you had a few few bottles of imported lager every day. It could be up to 10 percent. Wow. Okay. So that's like an example. Yeah. He does it. He sort of goes through all different types of food. Because when you go for a curry at a local restaurant, you're like, I've got to have a cobra, and like, <laughs> I'm not sure where that's manufactured really, but in my head it's Indian. Yeah. It's probably not. It's probably manufactured in like Slough or something. But yeah. yeah. That's the thing. You don't know. Like, yeah. well, there's so yeah, so much profit. Like there's a there's a wine um, bottling plant really near us in Manchester. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. they get yeah they get wine from all over the world, but they bottle it in which is obviously such a massive saving in terms yeah. of transport and carbon. And they're, and they're super low carbon super in, low in what they do, aren't they? Yeah. So they've got wind turbines and solar panels on their, on their site. And I understand rumour on the grapevine that our friend Paul Chandler told us that they're going to try and extract heat from wine, so wine source heat pump, which is kind of amazing, nice. to, uh, to heat their warehouse. That's brilliant. And actually, like some of the things you said there have been really exciting. I've not met, I've not read Mike Bernersley's book yet. I just bought the it's the the new edition that you mentioned. But um, there's this great um, website that is a lady called Rosalind Redhead, which is an amazing name. She's running for London Mayor, it, interestingly. Um, but she is trying to live this ten ton lifestyle um, and documenting everything she does and using Mike Bernersley's book to to kind of work out how much she's emitting, which is which is. A big challenge to, to document it all is a big challenge, but I'll put her blog website in in the, the, the links below. Um, but I've been really challenged by her to say actually every decision we make has got a carbon decision in it as well. Like, um, it can we can we can we kind of like value engineer our lives based on carbon, you know, as well as like budgeting on cost. You know, it's like we've got to, we've got to look at that. Um, and I will now drink a pint in the pub differently. Because what you just said, I'm gonna go for the local Durham ales or wherever I'm going to visit the cask there, rather than the beer or Moretti or the. This is great. What so? What's your summary for a sustainable diet? My summary for a sustainable diet: We need to feed a growing world food population with a healthy, tasty, low carbon diet, and we need to achieve this whilst preserving and improving the biodiversity that is currently plummeting and and we also need to stop plastics pollution and preserving the land that we we could be using to kind of be actually um putting carbon back into yeah, the soil yeah. so yeah so what we could do personally um with our lifestyles eat less meat yeah is the number one yeah. thing so whether that's uh, meat free mondays whether that's meat free lunch times whether that's only meat at the weekends just treating me as a treat and a luxury, not something that we take for granted, yeah. and have every every lunch just have a ham sandwich or sure. having our sandwiches. Um, but thinking about uh, it as a treat, and therefore when we do eat it, eating grass fed and, and locally produced will make a massive difference. Being modest with our fish consumption, as you said, yeah. fish are friends, and try and like chat to the fishmonger if you're going to get fish and, and work out whether how how it's got to us and how, whether it has the thing that it is. Get to know your supply chains yeah. and try and buy foods from the ones you like. And um, there's all sorts of complications with our supply chains and it, it might be to do with slavery and all sorts of other issues that yeah. come with our food supply chains. But um, but it's kind of thinking about what what you like, what your supply chain, what, what are your favourite things about your supply chains? 
the food that you're getting. So whether it's it's locally grown and seasonal, yeah. or slavery free, or fair trade, or shipped by boat, it's starting to work out those sorts of things. And, and with that, minimising um, the amount of carbon, the amount of antibiotics, the amount of deforestation, the amount of slavery that's gone into to your meal that's on your plate. Planning your meals before you shop and using up everything um, in your fridge. Yeah, you're great. So wasting less. Those are my kind of... That's the sustainable food. lifestyle. That is the low-carbon <laughs> diet. Low-carbon lunches. What's about that? We can brand that. <laughs> so one of the things you mentioned there, so I mentioned a guy, one of my spiritual heroes last in the last episode, um, which is Shane Claiborne, our mate. We met him. We like him. Hero. Yeah. Um, but he... I remember he used to talk about only eating meat of, of the animal if he knew the name of the animal that yeah, he's living in. Okay. Which is kind of, you kind of like, oh, that feels a bit crazy. But actually, if you've reared a cow or a pig or a chicken um, and you know it, you've fed it every day, you've worked for it, haven't you? And, that, and that's, it feels like you've earned been able to eat that, eat that meat. In, in Carrick Durham Restaurant, I love Broomhouse Farm, for example, where I understand they, all the meat that they serve is, is, is reared locally, which is, which is great. And it's grass fed. And it's grass fed. That's really good. And so, and, and I think one of the things for all this stuff, this low carbon lifestyle stuff, whether it's energy or fuel or our money or our clothes, it's saying that all this is a pre- precious resource. And I think what you said there is that meat or food in itself, this is precious. And, it's, and there's so much gone into it um, that we need to be careful about. Um, and to value it. Value it, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and give value to it. And then the last point that, that I think um, you, you kind of touched on a little bit was, and it's similar again to the, this, the sustainable um, fashion stuff is that word organic. I don't think you said organic, but um, and that's sometimes like a, a, a dirty word, isn't it? Organic. You see it, you see it on a shelf, and you're like, oh, what does that mean? Is it just for hippies? But but the idea of growing food organically, so that we're not wasting, um, whether it's in fertilizers or overusing overusing water, we're growing it in the right place, and all this kind of stuff is is still important in the story. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think a big part of that is antibiotics, the dangers of becoming completely immune to all by antibiotics in the yeah, world. Yeah, gosh. It's a real one. And then, yeah. Particularly eating you, meat that has been pumped with antibiotics. And you start to think about this American trade deal that we're going to negotiate and, and we could talk forever on this now, <laughs> which we won't, but yeah. Well, okay, Brill. Thank you so much, Nikki. I think that's a good whirlwind uh, summary of sustainable eating, sustainable food, all that kind of stuff. Um, what we're going to do on local lifestyle is we're going to eat less meat, we're going to eat less dairy, we're going to eat locally, we're going to stop wasting, and we're going to support reviews and all that stuff. Does that sound great? Yeah, great. Great. We're going to get to know our supply chain. Brilliant. And the supply chains. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs>